Hey, um, in the name of Allah, the compassion is the merciful. Hello, everyone. Um, finally, today we came to the uh, very happy ending of all the um, presentations that were supposed to be delivered. And I hope that everyone who's right now present in the um, in the class have already delivered their presentations, because otherwise um, uh, there will be no marks. And uh, any student who have not done their presentation will lose the 25 marks, which I hope that happens to no one. Um, the uh, the topic that we're going to cover today, and we will um, finish today because it's not a very long topic, it's about the legal aspect of globalization. And um, we are going to get familiar with, um, with the legal terms that you may hear in the business world. And of course, in general, it will cover the topics of um, of uh, law and business law to some extent. And it's pretty much interesting um, to know some of these topics and to discuss them. Uh, the contents that we are going to cover today will be an overview of the legal environment, the classifications of law, the legal risk, that um, global companies face, the national legal systems that uh, the the, uh, the types of legal system that different countries are practicing. Ahmad, could you? Sorry. Okay. Um, the legal framework of the EU and uh, the cross-border transactions, the settling of international legal disputes. What are the uh, how the companies approach their disputes and how do they settle their disputes when it comes to their um, to their international business. Talona, um, please please mute your micro uh, your microphones. Mr. Nasrat. Okay. Um, then uh, we're going to discuss the, uh, I mean, we're going to talk about and cover crime and corruption, impacts of international law on business, uh, human rights, and finally the, uh, the conclusion. The, uh, the overview of the legal environment, as you can see in the, um, in, in the center, it's about the national legal system. It's the legal system that of the sovereign country or the independent country practices within its own borders. For example, the uh, the law that the country of, of Afghanistan is practicing within Afghanistan, the laws that the government of Malaysia is practicing within the borders of Malaysia or any any independent country. Then the outer side of this um, basically cent uh, the center would be the regional um, lawmaking authorities, like for example the European Union. When it comes to the uh, independent country, we will discuss like a country, for example, like Germany, like France, and the uh, the laws that they practice within their own one country. However, when it comes to the regional aspect, it will cover the broader picture, and it will be um, the, the good example of it will be the uh, the European Union. Which um, which has its own set of laws and regulations and policies and etc. Which of course all the member countries they have to abide by these rules and regulations. Then finally the out the uh, the outer uh, side of this diagram will be the international legal obligation, which covers the obligations of countries towards the United Nations because the United Nations is the um, it's the most acceptable international entity that almost all countries of the world are a member of. And as far as I know, until a few months ago, there were only three countries that were not part of the UN, which was South Sudan and Vatican and um, another country which I don't have in mind. Other than these three countries, like all the countries in the world, they are a member of the United Nations, which means that they accept all the rules and regulations and all the laws that are passed by the United Nations. Then um, it, it just it's just giving a uh, basically a brief 
a briefing of what we just discussed. If, if you can see on the right side of the picture, which is here, it's the flag of Austria, and it's about the national jurisdiction. So it's about the jurisdiction that is valid within the country of Austria and nowhere else. And uh, the types of um, the types of uh, basically uh, the uh, the items that fall under this jurisdiction would be, for example, the contract, the employment, the crime, environment, intellectual properties, negligence and product uh, li liabilities, competition, and the laws and regulations that that are regarding any company that are operating within the country. When we look broader, it will come to the um, it will come to the regional jurisdiction, which we gave the example of European Union. Which in this type of jurisdiction, we will cover consumer protection, environmental issues, and also the uh, the competition that exists between the countries that are operating within the member countries of the uh, of the uh, European Union. And finally, we have the international jurisdiction which we all know about the United Nations. And as we can somehow all realize, it will, it will um, address the, uh, the uh, basically issues such as the environmental issues on the broader picture. Like for example, when it comes to the oceans, when it comes to the, um, I don't know, like basically things that cover many countries. And we have the human, if, if there is any human rights violations or labor standards or et cetera. These will be under the jurisdictions of, um, uh, of the United Nations. In the classification of law, we have um, two types of law within, um, basically within, I mean, amongst all the countries of the world, which is one, the public law, and the other one is the civil law. Uh, or actually, when it comes to that, it's the civil law and the um, common law, which is because we have, uh, I mean, you will you will see it as we go on. It's a bit confusing, and I hope you don't get confused. We have two types of civil law. One of it, which is right now here, this is this is referring to the private um, to the private law. So all the countries of the world they have the civil law. You see, when it, when it comes to the public law, public law it concerns the relations between the citizens and the state. It's about the individuals and the government. So one side is the government, the other side is the individual. When it comes to the civil law, it concerns the relations between the individuals and companies. So the government is not in the picture, and the state is not in the picture. It's only about individuals and companies. Okay? So right now we discuss public law and civil law. Now we have the litigation. Litigation is when like two companies or uh, two individuals, they have a problem, they, they face a dispute, and they decide to settle their dispute in a court, in a court of law. That will be called litigation. And uh, finally, we have the criminal law. Criminal law is it's when a crime is committed. It's when, um, it's when the offender is prosecuted by the court. And it's like, for example, if God forbid someone killed someone else, um, like in Islamic countries, we say that okay, if the if the family of the one who is killed, if they say we will forgive that person, that person should be forgiven, so they will not basically um, behead that person. I mean, they will not execute him. However, the government will say okay, you as the family of the one who is dead, if you say that you have no more um, complaints, it's fine. You're out of the picture now. We will not prosecute him. However, we as the government of the country in which this crime has been committed, we will not forgive this person. And he has to say, uh, he has to go to jail for, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, or whatever. So that's how they will settle it. It's not all about criminal law. It's when there is, um, it's when there is a crime that happens and one side of it is the government, even though it may happen between individuals. And finally, as you can see in the last line, which is the important part, every country has systems of civil and criminal courts. So all countries have this. It's common. Okay? Now, we're going to, um, to see the other laws, which, um, okay, we don't have it in this slide. I will just give you the uh, introduction here. All the countries of the world, they are either... Uh, they either follow civil law or common law.
common law is the type of law which is followed by the English and the British, which you have countries like Australia, like UK, like Scotland, like New Zealand, these countries, or even India, they follow the common law. And it's about the law that is based on precedent, and it's based on what the judges make the law. In, in, in further slides, we will cover this. And we also have the Roman civil law. That civil law, should not, you should not confuse that civil law with this law, this one that we have here. Because that's the Roman civil law, and it refers to the law that it was first made by the Romans, and it's a law that is it is written down. Because the difference, one of the differences between the Roman civil law and the common law, is that common law is not a written down law. Basically, the constitution and the, the set of laws is not written down. It's all about the laws that the judges make. However, the Roman civil law is a set of laws that are written down, and um, everyone can see. There is, of course, another third type of law, which is the Sharia law, and Sharia law is the law uh, which is based on Islam, and many of the Islamic countries, such as um, Iran, Saudi Arabia, I think Afghanistan as well, and some other countries, they are practicing that law, which is called the Sharia law. It's not, it's not a Roman civil law, and it's not a, um, and it's not a common law, However, it's somehow similar to the civil law in the sense that it is written down. Basically, the judges, they cannot come and make a new law in the Sharia law. The Sharia law is a set of law that is written down. And uh, we have the legal risk. Um, the legal risk is it's, um, it's every independent state, every independent country, they have their own legal system. We discussed this. Through the laws that are made and applied and enforced. Basically, they make the laws, they apply the laws, and they enforce the laws. The legal system exists in the country's social, cultural, and political environment. That also makes sense. It covers everything, all the aspects, that, um, all the aspects of, uh, of a country. The legal risk it only comes into picture when, um, when, when, a, when a business or a company is it's operating in another company, in, in another country, and it's beyond its national borders. It arises in a situation where business takes place across national boundaries. Because the reason, it's, it's because of the conflict that may happen. Because if, I, if, I'm, a con if I'm a company that is operating in Dubai, for example, and I'm under the laws of UAE, if I move across to another country like Afghanistan, or if I move to another country even, let's say, in Europe, there will be a conflict in laws because each of these countries, they have their own set of rules and regulations, and this conflict can be considered as a legal risk. We will see the examples of what we mean by the legal risk, but just as for the sake of the definition, this is the, this is the definition of it. Countries where the rule of law and independent judiciary exist offer a more predictable legal environment than authoritarian systems or totalitarian systems or dictatorial systems. What do we mean by this sentence? We, we are, we, we're saying that um, the, level, the level of um, the level of instability in a country where the legal system is not clear, it's high. When you are working and when you are doing your business in a country where the legal system is very clear, you don't, you don't feel much risk. Why? Because everything is clear and you know about everything. Everything is predictable. You can predict uh, the, uh, the, the legal situation that's there around you and around the, uh, your business. And in these authoritarian systems or totalitarian systems, there is a lack of transparency, so everything is not clear. There is a likelihood that a government interferes in the business. And, and we see that in our countries to some extent. We see, that, um, uh, we see that at many occasions, the businesses are not really running their businesses 100%. To some extent, the government are interfering, and this is not right. Because as for the open economy, as long as the company is not doing anything illegal, they are open to do whatever they want. As long as, as I said, if they are under, I mean, within the legal framework. 
and of course industrial properties which is like um, intellectual property is also more at risk in those countries because for example if you're working in China for example and and you have an intellectual property or let's say you're in the movie business and you're in entertainment business and you're selling um, original DVDs if you move to China you have a great risk why because the government of China will not support your business in terms of not uh, in terms of considering um, it or in terms of um, basically punishing the ones who do the illegal copying of the uh, of the CDs, for example. Why? Because as for the rules and regulations and laws within China, this is not illegal. There is no intellectual property in those countries. So that's what we mean by the legal risk. Um, the thing which you're saying about iPhone and Samsung, Yes, it is about a legal risk, but it's, it, it falls under the intellectual property. In fact, it's a very good example which you just brought up, and I will ex explain this in terms of what we just discussed. The issue that I think we all know about iPhone and Samsung that happened, that happened uh, about a year ago, it was about a dispute that um, iPhone uh, went to court and said that Samsung is producing products that are very much similar to my product. So how do you think this, what was the illegality in this situation? It was basically the intellectual property. It was complaining that, listen, I don't have an intellectual property. I mean, a company like Samsung, they cannot copy my, um, my product. And in fact, the court, since it was in a country where it was not an authoritarian system, in fact, it was um, it was a it was a country where the rule of law and independent judiciary existed, so there was a predictable legal environment. So iPhone, for example, knew that if I go and if I go to court for this situation, I can prove my point. Why? Because there is there is um, there is transparency in the legal system of of the United States and even in Europe. So, um, so that's how it happened. Um, as we said, and as we discussed the, uh, the, uh, the definition of legal risk, these are the, some of the examples of legal risks that companies face. As discussed again in the previous slide, legal risk is um, it's mainly um, types of risks that happen when, um, when companies are moving beyond their borders and they are going global. Accidents are an example involving hazardous processes like for example let's say um, uh, pharmaceutical companies they have radioactive products that may be hazardous or even electronic companies like let's say even Apple if they move to another country like some of their machineries for example they may have high voltage or it, it may to some extent be harmful for the laborers who are, uh, who are operating that system then we have product liabilities. For example, in the car industry, you have the faults in cars. In this situation, what happens is that, I think you've seen it in, and you've read it on the news on many occasions, like one of the recent ones um, was what happened with Ford and um, there was a problem in their brake system, I think. In one of the models of Ford, there was a problem in the brake system and they had to recall all the Fords of that model that they have exported to like let's say 60 countries and they had to um, recall it and that's a product liability why because there was a problem in your product and you're and you're obliged to um, to overcome that problem so that's how it was settled you have contract terms at many occasions to to um, companies who have contracts with one another from different countries of the world. Let's say I'm a company in Dubai and you're a company in Afghanistan and we have a con contract for let's say import and export of some product. And in our contract we have some legal terms, we have some things that we have to abide by and we have to consider. And uh, and uh, and there is there is one clause in every contract which is which talks about the um, disputes, and it talks about arbitration. So it says that okay, if 
if my company faces a problem and a legal problem with your company, how are we going to settle it? I may say that, listen, I'm a company in UAE. I don't accept the law of, of Afghanistan, so I don't, I don't accept, uh, I don't accept the Afghanistan court. And you say that, okay, you're a company based in UAE, and I don't accept the, uh, the UAE court. So how do we settle it? We go to a third country. We say we 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 agree on a third country, which usually it's the International Chamber of Commerce, which is in Paris, in France, that or in the or the um, Court of England. These are the two international courts that usually um, companies put in their contract as as the source of arbitration. So they say that okay, in case that we find any disputes, we go to these courts in order to settle our disputes. Then we have accidents in the workplace. That's something similar to what we had up here. And it talks about involving employees of a subsidiary or a licensed manufacturer. We discussed this and we gave the example of, let's say, iPhone or Apple. If they move to another company and they have a subsidiary or a licensed manufacturer, if, if a machinery has high voltage, that risk of um, accidents that may happen in the workplace, it's a legal risk. We have environmental damage, like the pollution, like the air pollution or water pollution, and uh, which, which can be a legal risk and it's a legal dispute that can happen in, uh, when two businesses are working together. And in the intellectual property, which we gave the example of China and like let's say the DVD industry and uh, the entertainment industry. Which, um, which you will not be pretty much supported by the government of China in case you're operating your business in that country. Uh, this is something that was... Yes, of course. Um, the, the example which you're saying that, I, I, I'm not really sure what you mean, but if you're talking about two Afghan companies operating um, within Afghanistan, in that case, they don't need to go to outside court. They they have to settle their court with with the um, with the court of Afghanistan, and they all have to be abiding the laws of Afghanistan. But if they are doing their business with another country, in that case, the other company may not accept the rules and regulations of of, of Afghanistan, so they move to a third country. Yes, as I said, they have to, they have to, and this is the point, and this, this is why I told you that this is important, uh, this slide is important, because let's go back to the name of our class. We're, we're talking about international business, and our main topic and emphasis is on globalization. So, um, if you're a company and you want to deal with outside world, and if you do want to um, deal with a company outside your country, you have to consider these issues and you have to at least have heard about these things at least once in your life in order to be successful. Of course, you don't need to know business law and all these details because if you are a big company, you can easily hire a lawyer to do this for you. But as the managers of a company, of an international company, at least you should be familiar with these terms. Yes, as I said, this is something that they can have and they can hire. Anyhow, um, in this diagram, it's showing the, um, the difference and the distance between the countries when it comes to their legal transparency and when it comes to their legality of, um, of their countries and how legal these countries are and how much rules and regulations are strict in those countries. As you can see on the top, it's Denmark. Denmark and other Scandinavian countries like Denmark, Norway, uh, these are countries that um, they are very, they have, they have very transparent legal systems and they have very legal, uh, I mean, a very strong legal systems. And uh, that's why there is, you have the least amount of legal risk operating in those countries because you perfectly know that all your rights are protected and you don't have any problems. However, as you can see, one of the lowest in this diagram is Russia. So this means that doing business in Russia has high legal risk. And of course, any other countries that is falling in between, it's, 
it's with let's say a, a more moderate level of legal risk as compared to Denmark, which is all the way on top, and Russia, which is all the way in the bottom. Okay, if you remember, I told you don't confuse the civil law in that slide with this law. As you can see here, we have civil law again. And uh, it's talking about the national legal system, which we discussed to some extent. So I'm just going to read through the slide. The civil law tradition is based on comprehensive legal codes. Legal codes means that it's written down. It's on a piece of paper, so you can see the rules and regulations. Whereas the British common law is based on a body of judge-made law through decisions, through case decisions. Like, um, what do we mean by cases? If you see the, I, I don't know which one of you guys are familiar into um, into business law or law in general. Um, in UK, for example, if you see their books and if you see their, all right, let me put it this way. If you go to France, France has civil law. So if you go to France, you can see their constitution and you can see all their laws and regulations written in one book. However, if you go to, um, if you go to, uh, let's say um, England, where there is the common law, you don't see the rules and regulations written down like that. You see cases. Like it says, for example, in the disputes between, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, company XYZ and company ABC, this was the problem, this is what happened, and this is what the court decided on. This becomes the law. So if 50 years later, the similar situation happens, when it goes to court, the judge will say, okay, based on the case of XYZ company with ABC company, where the judge held 50 years ago that this, is, this should be the law, I will also make my decision based on that. So, so if you understand my, my, uh, what I'm trying to say, they make their decisions through the cases which they have decided before. Yes, I, I think you're trying to say the Farsi term of it, which is, uh, which is really, uh, yeah, whatever. Um, th that's how it is. I mean, it's, it's based on what happened in the, uh, in the past. So both types of legal systems are now heavily supplemented by legislation to cover the new situ situation and involving business practices. So this, both types of law are, laws are supporting business practices. So businesses that are operating in countries that are practicing civil law or common law, they don't have to worry about business law. Why? Because both types of legal systems, they do cover the rules and regulations that are related to businesses. And finally, we have the Sharia or the Islamic law, which affects business transactions in Muslim countries such as Saudi Arabia. Financial instrument must be compliant with the Sharia law. So like, like for example, this, this is where the term of uh, Islamic banking comes into practice. Like if you have, you don't have Islamic banking, like let's say in Europe or in America, or like let's say in South American companies or Africa, you have this uh, concept of Islamic banking in countries that are following the Sharia law because the law is forcing these companies, uh, uh, these banks and institutions to follow these set of rules and regulations. And, uh, and finally at the end, which of course it makes sense, it's saying that both Western and non-Western systems have evolved as global markets have expanded. So you have the evolution and you have the concept of evolution happening in the legal system. So the rules and regulations change. Like for example, 50 years ago, there, there was no rules and regulations for like let's say um, internet crimes. Why? Because there was no internet at that time. So as the time has passed and uh, for example, internet was introduced to the world, then they came up with um, rules and regulations that um, protect people against any uh, people and also businesses against any um, online, like let's say, um, violations.
Now we're going to discuss the legal framework of the European Union. The European Union has a legal personality, which we all know. Why? Because the group members, the member countries of the European Union, they all accepted it and they support it and they enforce it. So basically, um, it's a legal personality. Hence, it can make treaties in its own name. So it can make rules and regulations under its own name. And it has its own legislative authority. So they have a they have a court that settles the disputes within the European Union countries. And even sometimes its its laws may be contradicting to some of the other countries. Like for example, the a law in the European Union um, uh, legislation may contradict to a law that exists within, like, let's say, the country of Germany, because Germany is uh, is applying laws for its own countries, uh, for its own country, whereas European Union is for a number of countries. So it may and it may have some conflict to some extent, but of course, all the member member countries accepted it. Uh, the EU law is recognized in all the EU member states, which we just discussed. The legislative function is shared by the Council and the Parliament, the EU Parliament. Then you have the types of EU laws. You have the regulations, which are directly applicable in all member states. And you have the directives, which require the member states to implement their provisions. So regulations is when, um, it's when they strictly have to follow what is mentioned by the European Union. Directives will be when uh, it's you can somehow consider it as um, as suggestions, as directions that are given by the uh, European Union. So that so those countries they have to make modifications in their processes. It's not a direct order. Regulations are like direct orders. Directives are like suggestions, are like directions that are given by the um, EU to its member countries. The judicial function of the um, European Court of Justice, which in abbreviation in short is ECJ, is the final authority on matters of the EU law. It's understandable. So it's the final authority. It's, it's the far top authority. And it plays an impact role in business regulations, such as the competition laws. Uh, uh, is this written in the contract that if any conflict takes place for a country? Yes, yes. And um, if you if you go Google it on the internet, I'm sure you can find it. Like just Google, like let's say sample um, contract or sample legal contract. Uh, you will see that towards the end of the contract, on the last page of the contract in the bottom, they have one clause which is called arbitration. And arbitration refers to how these two parties of the contract or how these number of parties in that contract are willing to settle their disputes. And, and in fact, that's why they say that when you want to sign a contract, make sure you understand all parts of it. And even if you're not an expert in contracts, you can give it to a lawyer or a, like say a legal advisor to do this for you. Because all these um, parts of the contract may be very important and very essential because like for example, let's say, I'll, I'll give you the exa example that how dangerous it can be to your business. If if you are, like, like, like let's say Apple company, okay, you are producing some techno technologies that are unique and uh, uh, basically you, ha you should have that intellectual uh, property. And you and you expand your business to China, and you decide to set your, like let's say, your factory in China, and you don't know about the laws of China. And the next day, you wake up in the morning and you see that another company has copied exactly your product, okay? And in your contract that you had with that local Chinese company, he says that okay. For arbitration, for settling any disputes, we will go to the Chinese courts. We will go to court of China. So right now, you cannot go to any international court. Why? Because as per the contract which you signed, you have to go to the Chinese court. You go to the court of China, and he says that, okay, they didn't do anything illegal. Why? Because we don't have intellectual property in China. So he can copy your product without any problem. So what happens? You lose your business. 
So that's why it becomes really important for you to to read and understand every every part of the contract, including this part which is um, related to settling your disputes. Cross-border um, transactions. So when 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 we are um, doing our business uh, internationally and globally, what are the things that that come uh, come into picture? The UN harmonization has helped to facilitate the cross-border contract. So basically, the UN and all its subsidiary bodies, legal bodies, they support when it comes to business. They support these rules and regulations, and it makes it easier for you because just picture the world without the United Nations and without all these bodies that lie uh, basically under the United Nations, these legal entities, you would feel so afraid to move your business to another country. Why? Because there was no one to support you if something happened. And uh, basically you had no support and protection against any violation. So what happened was that the UN harmonization and the and the uh, existence of UN, it helps to facilitate the cross-border contra contract and uh, global transactions. Convention on Contracts for the International Sales of Goods, it covers the formation of contracts, it covers the obligation of the par parties and the remedies. So, as you can see, um, this, uh, wait, let me, okay, this, which is the Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, it's under, it, it operates under the United Nations. So what does this legal body do for you? It helps you on the formation of contracts. Basically, it supports you when it comes to writing your contract. It supports you when it comes to um, generating your contract. And uh, it supports you when it comes to the obligation of parties. If you are the buyer and the seller doesn't do his part, this legal entity will support you basically or if or if other way around if you basically exported your product and you did not receive your money you have a support when it comes to this convention and you have the remedies this convention mentions um the remedies and the way that these uh, disputes can be settled basically how how much and what will be paid in order to settle that dispute. That, that falls on the remedy. Then you have, um, you have another uh, international body, which is UNICROIT, Principles of International Commercial Contracts. It uh, it, it, this is a set of terms which parties can apply, adapting them as needed, and the water application that CISG covers contracts besides the sale of goods. So uh, these are all um, these uh, basically these are the international legal systems that support you as a company who is trying to um, trying to go globalize and internationalize. I don't know. I, I, I'll just give you this as an uh, as further explanations. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the um, uh, with the uh, banking industry. Like, if you see the LCs and the term, terms that are mentioned on the LCs, those are those are international rules and regulations. It, it's not related to any specific countries. Of course, some banks they may modify it to some extent. And as you can see here, it's a set of terms that can apply adopting them as needed. But still, in general, there are rules and regulations that are supported by these um, international conventions and the World Bank and, and all these international entities that are there to support and facilitate um, the cross-border transactions. Moving on to the next slide, it, it talks about um, the negligence and uh, product liability. We want to see that um, what are the uh, what are the problems that can arise um, leading to disputes between two or more parties. 
first we have the tort law. The tort is like it's any small crime that has. It's not a crime. It's it's a it's a it's a like trespassing. It's like when you it's it's small disputes that happen between individuals and companies. Problems that are very minor, like trespassing. Like for example, by mistake you were just walking on the territory which belongs to another person. You did not commit a crime. I mean, it's not a big problem. However, it is illegal. What you did was not right. So, so even if the owner of that land, if he wants, he can take you to court for that, but it's not a big crime. It's not a big problem. So tort law, it arises from obligations owed by those in society, such as a duty not to harm others. So, um, so as I said, tort laws, it, it, it refers to like um, minor disputes that happen between individuals within, uh, within a society. Then we have negligence. Negligence is a breach of duty uh, to, take, to take reasonable care, which causes injury or harm to another person or organization. Let's give an example. Um, you are working in a factory where um, they are producing, uh, I mean, they have machineries that, that are very dangerous, let's say, in terms of high voltage. And an accident happens for you, and the reason was because um, the management of that um, manufacturing plant, they did not provide you with the suitable um, uniform that protects you against this, like, let's say, high voltage machine, for example. You can go to court and sue the company which you're working for uh, as a result of negligence from their side. So it was a negligence from their side. It was a breach of duty of the manufacturing plant not to take reasonable care in giving you the proper uniform and giving you the proper cautions and giving you the proper um, even warning that caused you injury or it caused you harm Something happened to you. For example, God forbid you lost your arm, and um, so this was a this was a result of the negligence from their from the side of the manufacturer. Or insurance, for example, that, that insurance can be called as a remedy as well. Um, however, yes, that also falls under the same category. And negligence claim can result in large amounts paid in damages to the injured party or parties. I'm sure many of you have heard, even on the news or from friends, that especially in the U.S., people sue like one another or the companies. Like, for example, I remember, I will give you this example because it's very interesting. Um, in early 1990s, one woman, um, she used to go to McDonald's every morning to buy coffee and a muffin as her breakfast when she was going to work. So one morning... When she went to buy the coffee, she came to the car, and um, the, co the coffee spilled on her leg, and she burned her leg. So she went to court, and uh, basically she filed, a, uh, she filed a case against McDonald's, saying that, first of all, the, uh, the person at McDonald's, they did not give me the warning that the content is hot, which is crazy because you don't go and buy cold coffee. Of course, the coffee which you're buying is hot. Second of all, the cup which they gave me, it was a takeaway cup, but it easily spilled on my leg. It should have had proper protection so it wouldn't spill on my leg. And the court, um, and the court accepted this, and she was able to sue McDonald's. At that time, they were saying $1 million. So let's just imagine $1 million US million at that time. It was a lot of money. So what I'm trying to say is that these things are very important if you are running your business. This part of the world, I found the eastern part of the world and Asia, I would say that the legal transparency is not so much. But if you want to run your business in a western country or in the United States, you really have to be very careful when it comes to these issues. And these things which we are discussing today, it can become very important and it can even cost your whole business life. You may lose your business as a result of negligence. If if you're a company and and uh, 
as a result of negligence, like let's say one of your employees goes and sues a file case, and files a case against you, and let's say sues your company for $10 million, $10 million is not a small amount, and you can lose your whole business and go bankrupt as a result of negligence. So it's really important to understand these terms, and inshallah one day if you have your own big businesses, you will consider these issues and you will find them very important to your business success. Then we have the um, product liability as well. Um, product liability, it involves the strict liability for harm caused by, defect, by defective products. On top, when we were saying negligence, we were giving the example that can happen on your own employees, for example. However, on product liability, we just discussed that example with um, Ford and the, and the problem that I had with its braking system. So imagine that Ford um, did not notice this problem, and in the in everywhere in the world, people were using that car. So every accident that would happen, the police would give a report, and they would say, "Okay, this accident was as a result of the driver being drunk, or this accident was a result of overspeeding, or this accident was the result of a malfunction of the braking system of this car." In that case, that owner of that car can go and file a case against Ford saying that, listen, I, I, I drive carefully, there was no problem with me, I took good care of my car, but I still had an accident, and it was because of your problem, not my problem. It was the defect of your product. It wasn't because of the way I was driving my car. So it, this is what is called a product liability. It involves a strict liability for harm caused by defective products. Manufacturers of any mass product can be liable, in this case Ford. Often manufacturers issue a recall of faulty products. This is the thing which we discussed. So what happened was that Ford spent so much money and they asked all their um, representative office and their showrooms in the different countries of the world to send back all these cars. They had to fix them and send them back to their owners which is very costly. However, at the same time, it's something that you must do because if you don't do it, you're going to suffer a higher cost because imagine all these users of these cars, they can file cases against Ford and it will be just a mess and a chaos for that company. In developing countries, victims of negligence and faulty products can face steep hurdles in obtaining redress. This is what we just discussed. Unfortunately, in, in many of these developing countries, like such as our countries, if you, if you receive a faulty product or if, if you are harmed as a result of the negligence of your management, of your company, it's very unlikely and it's almost impossible for you to get a redress and to get a remedy. So if you go to court, basically court will not support you enough. So, so this is a problem that we have. Uh, yes, you are right, Mr. Uh, Mohammed Harun. The situation also must support insurance companies not to pay, um, to some extent, not re not really, because, um, for example, let's say if if you if you were if you were giving this um, point as a result of the example of the Ford car, which you were saying, if anything happens to that car. So the insurance has to pay for it. The insurance has nothing to do with the problem of the driver and the manufacturer in their dispute. Because anyhow, at the end of the day, the, manu the, insu the insurance company should know what they are insuring. So if they have insured your car, it means that they accept all the, uh, everything that is there with the car, unless there is a misuse of the driver. Like, you know, for example, how they have that law that if you, for example, if you are drunk driving and you have an accident, the insurance will not pay for it. Why? Because you were drunk. It's your problem. It's your fault. But, but in that case, mm, I don't really think so. Anyhow, let's move on. Then we have the competition law. So when you have global companies, when you have international companies, it means you have competition. So you must have a set of law that supports your competition. 
and basically to support you um, and your rights when it comes to competing with other competitors and rivals. Competition law rests on the assumption that the consumer will benefit from the competition in price, value for money, and innovation. So it, it's assuming that you're not supposed to be harmed and you're not supposed to suffer when it comes to competition. So it will support you. The competition law, it targets different types of anti-competitive activities. So it will protect you from some illegal things that basically makes the competition dirty. For example, it will prohibit agreements on restrictive practices, so some things will not be allowed. Oversight of mergers and takeovers to prevent a monopoly arising. So it will, it will um, somehow support the smaller companies. I don't think the competition law was really successful in the second item. Competition law has not been successful in oversight of mergers and takeovers because you see many mergers that happen across the world that to some extent, to some extent, not 100%, but to some extent, it created a monopoly. Like let's say, for example, um, when it comes to um, these automobile industries, like in Germany, you have Porsche, Volkswagen, and Audi. They, they became one company, basically. Of course, they have their own different brands, but it's, it's managed by one company. So I would say that in Germany, these three big manufacturers joining as one, to some extent, they created a monopoly. Because, of course, you have the Mercedes and the BMW on the other side as well, but these, were, these are more common cars in this market. So, but in general, we don't care about these small examples, but in general, which is the, uh, the intention of competition law, one of these intentions is to oversight the, uh, the mergers and takeovers to prevent uh, monopolies. Another, um, another uh, goal for competition law is to prohibit the behavior which is abuse of dominant market position. Dom having a dominant market position is somehow a monopoly. Basically, you're not allowed to um, take over a market by force. It should be open market. Yes, you may be taking over the market, but that should be as a result of your good product and low price. So, however, if you don't have a good product and you don't have a low price, it's, it's illegal for you to have a dominant market position. Why? Because it, this means that you're forcing yourself into the market, and this is illegal. EU competition authorities have been particularly active. Well, let's hope so. Well, they weren't very much successful in the merger of these three com companies which we discussed. Then China introduced a competition law in 2008, including an extraterritorial uh, dimension. So basically, they, they passed out a law and they introduced the competition law in 2008, and it, was, and it covers beyond their borders, which is something good to hear. So it means that to some extent, China is trying to accept these international rules and regulations as well. Settling international and legal disputes, which we discussed uh, earlier, the private international law, it determines which national law pertains in cases where more than one country is involved. If you remember, we discussed the companies, like two companies from two different countries, and they they set their arbitration to a third country. This covers the law governing transactions, the choice of forum of hearing the case, and the enforcement of court judgments, which we discussed already. What are the alternatives to costly litigation? Okay, so it's saying that in order not to face huge pro problems when it comes to um, uh, carrying on the, that transaction, carrying on that international transaction, is number one to have arbitration, to have that special arbitration in your contract, which is a submission of a legal dispute to a third party, which as I said, the third party is in 90% of the cases, it's either the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris or the um, Court of England. Arbitration, it offers the privacy and flexibility compared to formal courts, also cheaper and quicker, but a drawback 
is that it does not contribute to development of that law. Well, it makes sense because, like for example, the um, the Court of England, um, which is for the, the Business Court of England, they don't make the law, or the International Chamber of Commerce, they don't make the law. They are following the law. However, it's saying that it's the best thing because it's international and everyone accepts it. So almost all the countries in the world, they will accept to settle the disputes in, for example, International Chamber of Commerce. Then we have the crime and corruption. Society's attitudes towards the corruption are part of the legal risk in international business, which, of course, it makes sense. Society's attitudes towards the corruption. So, because everyone, they have their own attitude towards the level of corruption, it, because eventually it will, it will have an effect in the level of risk to, of that country which you're moving to. Because if you're moving to a country which even like let's say the legal transparency is high, but let's take for example Denmark as an example. We took we discussed Denmark in a few slides back that it was one of the best countries when it comes to um, level of transparency and strict rules and regulations. But let's say in Denmark there is high corruption. The level of um, death is high and the level of crime is high. Just because the uh, the uh, transparency is high, it won't it won't make sense. It won't mean that there is no risk in that country. Why? Because the crime is high. So crime and corruption it's really important uh, in the in the uh, in the country which you are planning to move your business to. In general, the advanced Western economies are perceived to have lower levels of corruption than developing economies. This is an unfortunate fact, and it's true. Criminal law, it applies in numerous areas of law, which we start to somehow discussed in the uh, uh, beginning slide. Environmental laws and health and safety law are part of the criminal law leading to fines and conventions. If you remember, we said that criminal, uh, we said that civil uh, law, it has to do with individuals and companies like fighting against one another and having problems with each other. However, if um, if the problem is between an individual and the government, that becomes criminal. Criminal is not only if you kill someone, which is, of course, an example of a criminal law because it's a crime. However, even, even other problems can be considered as crime as well. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. If you're over speeding with your car, if you're driving in the street, and um, and you're driving like the speed limit is 80 kilometers per hour, and you are driving 90 kilometers per hour. What happens if the police catches you? He will give you a ticket. However, let's say the speed limit is 80 kilometers per hour, and you're driving 200 kilometers per hour. The, the the police he will not give you a ticket anymore. They will take you to jail. Why? Because as a result of Driving 10 kilometers higher, it's, it's, it's okay. It's, a, it's like a tort. It's a small civil, um, basically, uh, crime. However, if you, are, um, if you are driving at that very high speed, you can cause the death of many people because if an accident happens, anything could, could happen. And that becomes a crime. So even the case of environmental issues, if it's, if it's minor, it's not a criminal law. However, if it's, if it's to a high extent, extent, it can be a criminal law. For example, again, if um, the amount of pollution that, are, you, are, that you are creating and you are um, disposing to the, let's say, nearby lake next to your factory, that will cause the death of all the fish that are there in the lake. And it can even, like, let's say, pollute the whatever, okay? So this becomes a crime. Why? Because many people around you will be suffering. So, so this will be a case between you and the government, and it, will, and it will fall under the criminal law. Criminal negligence can be the cause of an accident. Financial crimes such as false accounting and theft, it involves countries and individuals directed. We have the international law, which we again discussed to some extent. International law, it covers the body of rules laid down in treaties, like for example, the European Union Treaty, which are recognized by states or by member states or by European member states. 
enforcement depends on the cooperation of severe, uh, sovereign states. That also makes sense. This means that uh, the enforcement of EU laws it only relies on the fact that all the EU members will accept these laws. If they don't accept it, they cannot enforce them. The same thing falls under the. Uh, I mean, the same thing goes with um, the United Nations. If the United Nations, for example, um, passes a treaty or creates some laws or regulations, and let's say 80% of the countries that don't accept it, they will not be able to enforce it. International law has grown with globalization, which makes sense. Particular areas of growth in the context of global issues. So, of course, when it comes to global issues and you talk about globalization, so it means that this evolution is running around globalization, such as the environmental factor and the global security, including regional conflicts and also the human rights. Human rights is usually, it, it somehow considers like, you know how you have that law that um, kids below the age of, uh, I think, 16, they are not allowed to work, and it's illegal. So, um, so that's that's one of the that's one of the um, issues that will fall under the human rights, which will be addressed by the international law. Although international law does not apply directly to business organizations, international standards are increasingly recognized as, as author, uh, authoritative. Of course, international laws they may not pass laws that directly like. Uh, address your company. However, in general, it will create a safe environment and a safe haven for you to run your business. <clears throat> this diagram uh, will just discuss the things about uh, the international human rights. It's about the convention, which we just gave a very minor example. We can just read through it. The international con uh, Convenant on civil and political rights, rights to life. It, it's talking about the human rights as per the United Nations. All, every human on earth, they have the right to live. Every human on the earth, they have the right not to be held in slavery. And as you can see, it says you have the right not to be held. It doesn't mean like a person may say, okay, I want to be a slave. That, that's a different story. That person may be out of his mind. But no one is allowed to force anyone into slavery. So all humans in the world, they have the right against arbitrary arrest or detention. So you cannot be arrested for no reason. Freedom of movement and freedom of uh, choose of place of residence. So you are free to move anywhere. No, no one can restrict you from moving to another country or living in another place unless you have made a crime. Because if you, as you know, um, one of the decisions of courts for some criminals is that they limit their boundaries. Like they say that, for example, you are not allowed to leave your hometown. In that case, that's a separate story. But for a normal human being, they, are, they, they cannot be forced. Freedom of thought, basically it's about the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and etc. Right of peaceful assembly. So you can have peaceful gatherings and no one should stop you from having the peaceful gathering, which to some extent you see that many countries are violating, violating this right nowadays. You can see it even on TV. Like, of course, sometimes it, 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 gets, uh, it becomes violent, but as long as it's peaceful, it should be allowed and it's no problem. Yes, that's what democracy is. Democracy is a supporter of human rights, but this doesn't mean that all the human rights is necessarily um, democracy and international and economic and social um, and cultural rights. So that was about the uh, civil rights. Now it's about the economic rights. So now it's saying that every individual they have the right to uh, to just basically to equality and favorable conditions of work. So you should have uh, basically a proper condition for your work. They have the right to fair wages and a decent living. All individuals they have the right to receive good salaries and proper salaries, because otherwise it may be even considered as somehow a slavery. 
because even a slave receives wages, but the thing is that they have to suffer a lot and they receive very minimum wages. All humans they have the right to join an independent trade union. All the individuals they have the right to medical attention in event of sickness. So, which makes sense, and that's why it's um, uh, what do you call many uh, big companies and big manufacturers that even have nurses as their employees because if it's very likely for injuries to happen in their workplace, they even hire nurses and some. They have some medical equipment even in their plant. Why? Because all the individuals must be protected. They have the right to free primary education, so they can have their education, and they have the right to take part in cultural life. And finally, moving on to the conclusion, the legal environment for international business is dominated by diverse national legal system, which we discussed. We discussed that all the countries of the world, they fall under three different types of legal systems. We have the Roman uh, civil law, we have the English common law, and we have the Sharia law, which is the Islamic law. The legal risk is larger in countries with weak rule of law than in countries where it is strong. If you remember, we discussed that diagram. The legal risk will be larger in countries like Russia, which in that diagram was on the lower part, and it will be lower, uh, the legal risk will be lower in countries such as Denmark or other Scandinavian countries which were on the top of that diagram. Contractual obligations and, oblig uh, and obligations in tort, including the product liability which we discussed, are areas in which litigation is likely to arise. So it's saying that most of the disputes happen as a result of tort and even as a result of negligence, I would say, which can be long and costly. Competition law, which differs from country to country, is increasingly important for larger MNCs, especially when planning takeovers. That's why the government of China has decided to accept this law and even pass this law, uh, and, uh, and even considering it globally. International law is growing in both quantity and, uh, and authority in response to concerns over global issues such as climate change and human rights. So, as we discussed, all those types of legal systems like the uh, Roman law and the uh, common law, we said that all these, all these laws are evolving as time is going by and different cases are happening and different problems are arising. So the same thing is happening with the international law. It's saying that international law is also growing as a result of the expansion of the global businesses and the global issues such as the climate change and the human rights um, issues that are there around the world. So uh, we finally came to the uh, ending of this session. If there is any questions anyone has, I'll be more than happy to answer. If not, we can just call it off. I'm glad you liked it. Yes, I will email the, the slides. Don't worry. As, as, as the previous weeks, I will send the slides and there is nothing to worry about. Okay, thank you very much everyone and have a wonderful evening. So hopefully we'll meet up next week.